Uh oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple of newcomers into the temple. They are the double-headed monster responsible for Dragon Town, City of a Billion Lost Souls. In the red corner, we have G. Michael Rapp. And in the blue corner, we have Tyler McAllister. No, no Kevin jokes, please. I prefer using <laughs> tie-dye <God>. jokes. <laughs> that I can put up with. That I can deal with. How are you two doing today? <laughs> oh, pretty good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I'm watching the season seven and eight of game of thrones so not that great but i'm still doing okay all things considered um I... funny you meant funny you mentioned that when i finished house of the dragon not too long ago which um that's next on my list i've um, never watched game of thrones before mm -hmm. so i i have a complicated history with both game of thrones and a song of ice and fire mm -hmm. uh, some of it some of it is is due to the, is due to the fact that um I have some beefs with George R R Mar with George Martin. I know he mm -hmm. likes to claim claim the RR thing, but <laughs> that's not really the case. That's not really the case. And more and moreover his his attitude on character death kind of bugs me. Mm. But put but putting all that aside, um I expected House of the Dragon to be the absolute drizzling shits, bowling shoe ugly as as it might be. Mm hmm That is not the case. That's what I've heard. But given how given how season seven and eight en ended, I don't think I'm out of mm -hmm. line assuming that, that assume, uh, making that mm -hmm. assumption. That is fair. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't gotten to watch House of the Dragon yet, but that is next on my list after I finish uh, Game of Thrones here soon, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a big uh, um, medieval fantasy kind of guy. I mean, I, I watched Game of Thrones up to like season six, and I was like, meh, this is okay. I'm done. My but, favorite character uh, died in six, so, you know. It's yeah, been exactly. For me since then. Yeah. George George <laughs> Martin and Joss Whedon walk into a bar. Everyone's favorite character dies. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And then uh, season two gets canceled. Just kidding. Yeah, true. It's only true for one of them, at least, right? Right, right. Yeah. So far, I love the memes where you know like there's. There's these two friends, and one's giving them a, a thin mint case of DVDs, and goes, "Hey, well, I can't wait till season two. And you see the other one crying, you know? Yeah, uh, for Firefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, but leave it to the fans to finish it off instead. So, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. That ten that tends to be how this how this kind of thing works. Exactly. I think George will kick the bucket soon enough, so people will be able to finish it for him. So. Yeah. Uh, and me sorry. <laughs> and meanwhile, meanwhile, you've got meanwhile you've got um, you've got you ha you've got you've got the likes of um, of Brandon Sanderson managing to managing to put out more. Um, Managing to put out more, managing to put out more bo more books than Mar than Martin could think of. Yeah, exactly. Like he wrote like what three nine hundred page novels during the pandemic, or something well, like he was, that. He wrote, he wrote three novels while he was supposed to be on vacation. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and. Th and of course, and of course, things w things would get even 
crazier as as it went on. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. So, both of you, could you walk me through your introduction to role playing games and what made it stick? Do you want to take this first, Greg, or you want me to? I'll let you take it first. All mine's right. a long uh, one. Yeah, mine's mine's a bit shorter uh, overall, but um, it really funny funny enough. My introduction to role play basically started uh, sometime in I want to say high school with, believe it or not, a Gary's Mod military RP server that I became a moderator on at one point. Mm-hmm. I won't name them because they've sunk in popularity over the years, but uh, it was a really big thing, and I and I, I didn't even really know that I was getting into role play at that time, and then I didn't get into anything like that again until I think it was it's either 2017 or 2018 when I played my first D and D campaign, and it was uh, it was musically based because everyone that was playing was musicians. Uh, we called it Battle of the Bards, and didn't get to see that one to completion but we we sort of uh it was really fun because we would like actively play music during our sessions and we tweaked combat to be like music related uh and i think everyone was a bard as well uh so that was a lot of fun didn't really didn't that, that one didn't go super far just because of the scheduling conflicts and stuff like that but uh i would say i'm trying to figure out i i don't think that it was I think I just got invited to play because I do sort of have this. I did a lot of theater and uh, stuff like that. So I have a sort of knack for improv. And someone saw that and was like, you should come play d and I was like, I never have before. And then uh, after I tried it the first time, I was like, it was like, uh, you know, handing me a new addiction, basically. Because I was like, oh, I got to do this again. You know, <laughs> I was like, I like this too much. I love talking in character. I love like I love the collaborative storytelling aspect of it where we sort of yeah, the DM's got, you know, the the sort of story laid out for us, but we the, we as the characters get to shape it and determine like what that adventure is going to be like. Um so I really like it in that regard and I actually just this year took up my first time DMing, so I can say goodbye to ever playing a character again. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I, I started DMing a D&D 5e game, and then we've had to sort of put a break on that because uh, one of our players has been all around the country recently and is now pregnant, apparently, as well, so that complicates things, too. Um, and now my current game that I'm playing, I'm, that I'm also uh, not DMing, I'm refereeing, is actually uh, a game that we're doing an actual play of Dragontown, Ashcan Edition with, so... Mm -hmm. That is that is my journey into role play in a nutshell, I would say. Yeah, and I can I can certainly get that. Now, um, Greg, what ab what about you? So um, weirdly enough, I started. It, it feels like the old school way. I started with like playing chess, and then war games, and then just gradually grew bored of some of the bullshit that comes with. You know chess and war games where you're like hey i want this character to hide behind a wall so he doesn't die you know um and D, &D was not allowed when in the household i grew up in it was this demon's book you shall not go near it sort of thing and of course what did i do i went and checked it out and found out D, &D was kind of boring um and actually <laughs> started uh, my first real game was shadow run i think it was like the first or second edition mm -hmm. of shadow run and then, um, of course, D and D three point five at the time was um, starting to evolve into what would become the failed fourth edition. And then Pezo was coming out with you know um, Pathfinder first edition, and and then all the various I, I would say the indie games are what really got me to stick into role playing games. So like uh, um, Dogs in the Vineyard, um, let's see, Burning Wheel. And Burning Empire, uh, Empires, I believe is what it's called. Um, let's see, what else? Um, we made a lot of homebrew games, you know, um, based off of uh, Star Frontiers, which is an old uh, 
a 70s and 80s TSR game that tried to be like the D&D version of a, a space game. You know, very tried to be popular and cool and all that stuff, and it kind of fizzled out mm-hmm. um, in the face of D&D and all of its stuff. And so I spent a lot of time on internet forums, and that's actually where I got my real start into designing games and content for games and all that other good stuff. Um, because where I lived, you know, it was kind of a um, desert for role-playing games. I mean, there was this one guy I met up with, him and his uh, office mate, we'd play games um, for like six, seven hours straight. Then when I went to college, I had to be the forever DM like Tyler. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so my experience is kind of weird. You know, it's uh, I started out with in a family that said that these are evil, awful, nasty things. And then now I'm like, like sharing them. And now I'm sharing them with family members. They're like, oh, this is pretty cool. And I'm like, you didn't say that 20 years ago. Thanks, assholes. Yeah. You know? So I love the satanic panic age. Exactly. You know, and it and I, like I told people, I, I lived in a small mountain town in Colorado mm-hmm. and it was super conservative. I remember some priest declared war on Pokemon, grabbed like oh, yeah. a Pokemon plush, grabbed mm-hmm. a knife and cut its head off in front of the service. I was like yeah, as a kid, fourth demons, Greg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, idle hands and all. <laughs> and uh, I remember losing my uh, Pokemon collection, which I'm still pissed about because yeah. that could be worth some money these days. Um, my teacher threw them away, thinking she was doing me a, a service oh. for my mortal soul and all this other crap and whatever. Fuck mm. that bitch. Excuse my language, <laughs> but um, no, 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 no. You're um, we do we do not ho- we do not um. Hold we back, do, gotcha. We all do right. not hold back or curtail anyone's language. All these the seven dirty words you can't say on TV may as well be one of our mantras. All yeah. right, I like that. Shout out to George Carlin. Mm-hmm. Exactly. May he rest in peace. May he as much as he can. Exactly. He's probably rolling around <laughs> in his grave right now. Um uh, no, he no, what he's prob he's probably doing is is um is his go his ghost is haunting the cemetery, flipping people off. Yeah. yeah, that sounds legit. I, I like to think the happy ending where we've become the comedy show for George and he's just laughing at us now. And watching the grave. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, Clapping. He, yeah. Time, he gets to be a spectator now. Exactly. Yeah. So. But when... Given now, given all, given all of that, especially since you get, especially since you guys are, you guys are developing um, your own, <laughs> your own contribution to the indie insanity. Um, <laughs> where you get, where did you guys jump around between a bunch of different, si- between a bunch of different systems? You know, it's funny you say that. So when we, when we first came up with Dragon Ten, it was just a setting. Remember that Taylor or Tyler? Excuse me, Taylor. Oh my God, sorry. Yeah, dude. no, I can't believe this. Uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, it was a setting, wasn't it? And yeah, it was because like we... at two thirty in the morning, you text me and you're like, "Dude, we should do something with orc gangsters and stuff and all this." Up, and I just yeah, spiraled my... from there. My idea initially, because we had done a couple settings together. There's the Adventurer's Guide to Belruda, there's Backland Bay, there's uh, Cozy Addis are all settings that me and Greg have put together books for. And Greg had been talking about wanting to do a game uh, many times before this, I imagine. Greg's Mm -hmm. Greg's, uh, always wanted to to develop a game together. And my idea was, I that night in particular, I'm pretty sure I was just Googling... um, like fantasy noir uh, TTRPG games because I love the noir genre and I've been getting really into like TTRPGs. Um, And so when I couldn't find any that really suited my needs, I was like, well, why don't I just pitch this to Greg and see what he thinks? And he already had the idea for, for the setting of dragon town initially. And then I just came in and kind of applied like that noir fantasy element to it. The sort of 1940s America, uh, kind of idea i and i i can certainly i can certainly get that and i've talked i've talked about film noir in multiple forms on on this channel but Mm -hmm. for you what is the what would you say is the appeal of film noir uh that 
for me personally, well, first, of course, on a surface level, the aesthetic of film noir is very beautiful. Um, that sort of black and white minimalist kind of look is something that's always appealed to me and something I always enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I enjoy the way that noir can extend beyond the time period that it was created in because 40s noir is 40s noir because it was noir in the 40s. But noir can transcend. It's, you know, it's your your Blade Runner, your Sin City, your Seven, you know. Um, and I think that what noir shares is a lot of thematic elements. Um, you know, the the rotten old city that everyone knows is rotten but they live in it anyways you know you've got your starving artist over here you've got your mobsters over here you have your detective who just wants to do right in a city that refuses to let him uh i just love the stories that have been told through noir i love the style of it i love the jazz you know uh just a mixture of all of that i think is what um what makes it appeal to me and then to take that and take fantasy and mix them together I think it's just something you don't see very often. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wanted to really take a fantasy setting, noirify it, and then let people be able to run around in it and uh, sort of explore this. I was going to say neat little city, but Dragon Town's anything but small. It's a huge mm-hmm. place. So, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And that's my fault. I was like, I was like, oh, we should put like a billion people in it. And I was <laughs> like, oh, sure. Let's do it, dude. And I said, like, fuck it. Yeah. In classic noir fashion, we didn't think of the consequences of our actions before we did things. So now we have a gigantic city to build a map of. Mm. <laughs> so. so to yeah. get back to the systems, um, originally it was a setting, and then and then we kind of came up with the idea, maybe it would be like a d and D 5th edition kind of like, um, not really a clone, but... Uh, kind of one of these adjacent games. And then uh, I started playing around with uh, some ultralight uh, role-playing game rule sets like uh, uh, Breathless and um, um, Jim Parkin's Star Wars Ultra, Ultralight Star Wars RPG, which is like two pages <clears throat> long. And so what I came up with is... is um, this kind of uh, simplified system that, that with Tyler's help and the group that he's playing with, we've been able to kind of tighten up a little bit in our Ashcan edition yeah. to make it to where the rules aren't a stumbling block for players. So especially like new players, I mean, like look at the Pathfinder 2nd edition rule book. It's 600 some odd pages long. It is a beast you know, and it's intimidating. And so I was thinking, what well, what can we do is is um, give a, a really light rule set with Dragon Town, and then make the rest kind of a lore book and a and a and a thing that can help the collective storytelling and make it this kind of rich play environment for people. And so yeah, so we jumped around to a lot of systems, and the and the film noir to go to what Tyler was saying is it's got a pretty awesome aesthetic it's very minimalistic so that's why the rules kind of mirror that as well and then also um i'm thinking of um uh jade city i don't know if you've ever ever read that book um it kind of has a a fantasy noir element with crime and martial arts and a few other things Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm So, and that was another thing that kind of inspired me. And I remember being in Arizona at the time for a business trip and we were working on that first Kickstarter. And I, I remember sending Tyler a picture of it like, hey, dude, I think we found our, our inspiration and sent him a picture of the cover and stuff. And it was, it was kind of cool. It's just things just started kind of coming together for that game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And it's, it sounds to me like, like, um, in the chicken and the egg scenario, when it comes to when it comes to campaigns, some people write the setting first and then write the rules around it. Some people they do the opposite. Um, but that since that an- since that question's answered, it sound it sounds like for a while you guys were lo- you guys were looking for what system would best fit it. And of all the systems that could, that you could go with, what made you go with Breathless? So I worked with Breathless back in April for the Breathless SRD jam um, that uh, the creator put on. And I created a game called Bella Chow, and I had a lot of fun with it. 
And I kind of put it down, didn't really touch it. And then about, what, two months ago, I was talking with Tyler. I was like, dude, I, I think I got the system down. And I sent him something. And in, I'd seen also Jim Parkin's Ultralight Star Wars game. And so I was able to mash that and Fate and, um, of course, <laughs> Breathless into one because it has this, this tension element. Um, the mechanics are super simple. I mean... Um, for a beginner, they might be a little intimidating, but for the most part, they're they're pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Um, you're not having to do a whole lot of math. You know, it follows a rule of three, so one to two is a failure, three to four is a uh, success with complications, and five plus is a uh, resounding success. Mm -hmm. And so on a like a D6, that's pretty easy to break down, right? So that's you got three. Um, sets of numbers that you can really look to to see what success is, what failure is, and so on and so forth. And so in some ways it mirrors the the new fourth edition of Twilight 2002 where they're using die ratings and that seems to be a really popular move right now instead of doing like hard hardcore mathematics like the old school D&D 3.5 where you got a half dozen modifiers you got to add into the equation and then roll the D20. Um, we've capped a few things so instead of stacking modifiers um we've made it to where you stack to a certain point and after a certain point you have to start making choices like do i want to use this modifier or this one and why and so we're trying to simplify the math and breathless made that easy so did jim parkins ultralight star wars mm -hmm. um the idea here is to try to make it to where the referee doesn't have to do a whole lot of work that the work can be spread across the group and it can be a fun collective experience. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want that tension too. So Breathless has a, a, component, a component called Catch Your Breath. So we've added it to where if your character in the 1.5 edition of the Ashcan version, um, if your character doesn't catch their breath or take a break, then they, they take a hit to sanity, you know? Um, and they can refresh other elements like, say, their fortune, which is something they can use to modify dice rolls and all that other good stuff. Mm -hmm. So Breathless was a great like foundation that we've grown from, and we've grown to add other elements that we liked. And um, you know, we got like burdens, which are um, uh, use a compel feature from Fate. Um, from Jim Parkins' Ultralight Star Wars, we have. Uh, um, like uh, a simple list of for character creation. I think character creation takes up two pages. So instead of like 40 pages or 50 or 100 pages, it's it's about two to three pages long, and you can get playing right away. And that's that's why we picked Breathless and all these other elements and brought them together, as we wanted to make it to where, like, you could play the game within 10 minutes opening up the book, basically. You know? Nope. Go ahead. An issue, an issue that can happen whenever you have a game that's that's def that's going to be skill dependent is mm -hmm. is put is putting is putting way too many is putting way too many skills. From what I've seen in the in this case, you're relying on um, archetypes, mm -hmm. and with that was. The, with the use of archetypes, is that is part of that to make sure that people don't get choice paralysis when it comes to the um, skill list. That and also gives them some role playing possibilities as well. So each archetype has a little different essence, and there's skill there role playing opportunities that each archetype has that others don't. And then yeah, skill uh, choice paralysis is a huge issue, right? So if we just gave them all these choices. No one would ever play the game because they'd just be, like you said, <clears throat> paralyzed from all the, the the buffet line, so to speak, right? And so what we're trying to do is, in newer editions of the Ashcan version, is trying to tighten up the archetypes where they have starting skill packages, and then you have some point by part of it that allows you to kind of upgrade those skills, maybe buy some that you want to add into your archetype and then go from there. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, skill based is is a big, um, uh, how do I want to say it? Uh, gamble, right? Because you don't want to be like um, riffs where you have sixty two pages 
in their ultimate whatever guide with skills. And so we really had to kind of pare down the skills and be like, all right, what level of freedom can we give players with these skills? So like brewing is a great example. Like, well, what is brewing actually entitled? Is it, is it just for drinks? Now, something you consume, um, is it something that could be more chemically re related, it, um, you know, stuff like that. So uh, what I try to do is give advice to GMs and referees and say, hey, you know, here, here are some definitions, but modify it to fit the needs of your group as well. So that way there's not a, a skill list of <laughs> 300 skills, right? Yeah. And uh, Tyler can... Uh, attest to this on on some of it. He did a uh, play through what last week, right? Last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what do you have to say about the skills? Uh, so, what I ended up doing in my game is I gave each player uh, nine skills total. I think is what I went with, and we did mm -hmm. five is from their archetype, and then the other four I would decide based off of hearing the backstory of their character. Um. So that's sort of how I handled it. I think currently, because of the campaign that I'm running, it's uh, pretty specific with the skills that are going to be needed. Um, but I see a lot of potential for you know the other the skills that I haven't gotten to see in the campaign I'm running currently, like the entertain, mm. artistic expression, burglary. These are all ones that I didn't get to see in the campaign. But as it works currently, the way that I'm playing it, um, it definitely feels simplified. It feels easier, and I think. Uh, with the new the new way that we're using the fortune and discord mechanic, uh, I think it's gonna make things a lot smoother and also allow for some really cool uh, role play opportunities, which is what my main focus was because I think I've bitched enough to Greg about how much I hate combat in these games because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I feel like everything just psh, comes to a stop and I'm like, oh well, this isn't really fun. But with yeah. the, the combat when we when we played on stream, because I'm streaming the actual live play uh, every Thursday around 5 p.m. my time, um, mountain time for anyone out there who, who wants to know. Um, when we did combat, I just sort of, I uh, integrated it into the role play. You know, we have combat skills. Um, so I was making roles and they were making roles and we were just going back and forth with these different ideas of what were happening based off of the roles we were getting. And I just feel like it flowed, uh, so well and didn't interrupt, uh, the story at all for us to like stop roll initiative. And then, you know, oh, someone's going to work through like, oh, I have such and such abilities. I can do this and that and the other. It just felt like we got into it. Different people were do using different skills. Uh, some of them weren't even combat skills uh, as well. Some of them were using like manipulation, persuasion, all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just it 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 they really the skills really help uh, things flow, and it's it, it's super quick, super easy, and you pretty much get it on like a moment's notice, and you're able to instantly start rolling with it. So I, I think I think currently the skills are in a good place for me at least from yeah. what a little bit I've gotten to see of it because we have only had one session so far. Yeah. And with the with that kind of thing in mind, when it came to when it came to when it came to setting up the lore of the place, since you guys have had a a background with Shadowrun, um you guys are probably familiar with the issue of lore lockout that can happen. Uh, is that something that you guys consciously tried to make sure you avoid so that um when people are coming in that they don't that they don't that they don't feel like they like they're going to have that level of that level of impact so i think of lore as a as a way of adding to the role play experience so when we put together the ashcan edition of the rule book what i did is i took a lot of the lore that tyler had built and put it together as a uh, as sort of like a source book so you can take what you need to move things around, um, mm -hmm. remove stuff, ignore it entirely, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea here is is that it's it's more of a source of role play opportunities and storytelling rather than like in Shadowrun where I feel like you're in this very well developed <laughs> secondary world or rather Earth um, that uh, 
is amazing. It's a beautiful storytelling piece, but you feel like if you go into it, you, you're going to break it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that to happen, you know, like uh, in Tyler's campaign that he's currently playing uh, with his, his folks, it, the cool thing is, is that uh, they're kind of bending and, and, and stretching the lore that it currently exists in the source book. Mm -hmm. And so there's not that lockout. And more importantly, you don't have that, um, that anxiety of like, hey, am I going to break this by doing it, by even being part of this world? And because, yeah. yeah, there's some really beautiful role-playing game books, like I think of Eclipse Phase, which is a beautiful setting, but I'm afraid to play in it because I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, either I, I don't know enough about it or I'm going to mess it up and mess up the parts that I like about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is make it more of a source book, a, a, a well of inspiration for mm -hmm. players rather than a uh, um, something that's going to trap them and or push them out, you know? Right. So. And on top of that, I do write the... Uh... I did keep something like that in mind when I was writing the lore um, that I wrote it in such a way that there would be major events that happen, um, you know, because that's needed for a historical account. Um, but I wrote it in such a way that there's a sort of vagueness to it to where you could uh, insert such a, like whatever characters someone comes up with, you could put them into the lore at any given time in the timeline. And I don't think it would, necessarily break or uh affect things too much but on top of that i also really encourage people to do that as well mm -hmm. like the lore is just there to be like this is the world this is how we got to this point and these are some of the major players but you know people are free to come in and bend and shape the world however they want and this is just in my mind this is what dragon town is before you get here you know and so when it comes to Dragon Town itself, if you were to, if you were to ballpark as far, the size of the place, compared compared to real world cities, how big would Dragon Town be relatively? It'd be like several mega cities, like uh, and a mega city is a city of millions. It'd be so several like mega, mega cities, kind of like yeah, the mega the, cities in Judge Dread is what I'm, is what you're referring to. Um, yeah, what, minus the giant, um, kind of weird <laughs> architecture and stuff. I mean, there's weird yeah. architecture there too, but, um, we envision it of a billion people above on the ground and below. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of this almost 4d space, you know, um, one of the things I, I was talking with Tyler with a while ago is the, this idea of the heights and then also the deep down dark, which is, you know, the, uh, uh, subterranean part of the city yeah and where there's like little cities and settlements underneath and all this other cool stuff and then of course you got these spires and skyscrapers that reach to the sky and and then you got the poor joes who are on the ground and all that other stuff so mm. it's it's like your your uh the, the large city times maybe 10 or 20 you know it's a, it's a massive uh living breathing organism Yep. That is fantastical, of course, and is also a miracle of technology. Um, we envision it being part of our um, sh uh, setting, uh, Belaruda, where it's originally on the coast and then kind of spreads out. That's right. And it's kind of become this massive sprawl. I think of like uh, um, some of the imagery from like uh, Neuromancer when he talks about the sprawl on the East Coast. It's just kind of this expansive urban environment. As far as the eye can see, you know, and um, the the nations and other cities of the world envy, you know, Dragon Town and and have commerce with it, and they're competing with it and all this other good stuff. Mm. So it's it's yeah, it's it's a huge place, and it's it's tough to map because when when I originally um, proposed the 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 idea of this massive city to Tyler, I said, uh, you know, it doesn't have any updated maps. Because it's so huge that Public Works, that's the organization that keeps the city running, um, can never keep up with the map uh, and keeping it up to date. Mm -hmm. So, And so that was kind of a fun moment because we often assume um, that when we go into cities, when there's technology, all this stuff, magic dies away and is no longer here and all this other stuff. But rather, I think... Um, 
in Dragon Town, we've done the exact opposite, where magic is still very much part of the city and its inhabitants. Um, but a lot's been lost along the way, and then science is helping regain some of the arcane knowledge of magic, which we call uh, uh, magic or philosophy in the early drafts. Um, and then the users are known as phages, which are, you know, they have to consume something to use the magic. Mm-hmm. So, like, if you want to mess with metal, you have to consume certain metals to, to be able to, you know, manipulate that metal m- metallic element, you know, mm-hmm. so. Um, I can't, I, the idea of consuming metals to do magic, I, there's something that immediately comes to mind, and I'm pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's this, I'm pretty sure it was a frame of reference for you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, that mm-hmm. being, um, Mistborn, even if it's not exactly the same. Yeah, in some ways, and it's also uh, from anthropology too, like uh, a lot of cultures around the world um, prior to the modern era uh, consumed certain things in order to do uh, magical uh, tasks or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So like you might eat, uh, like in uh, early modern England, you know, uh, you might uh, eat uh, the shavings of a dead mummy for something or um you know pregnant women would use uh um like soils and stuff like that Mm -hmm. you know to to get not only nutrients but also other other things for the baby that they're carrying Mm -hmm. so yeah so it's it's mistborn but it's it's a lot bigger than mistborn too right it's this it's this um variety of of things that we've grabbed from our our schooling um our favorite uh games and books and stuff like that so yeah it's mm-hmm. it's a really cool experience being able to synthesize all that into what is dragon town yeah know? i remember initially because my whole thing with the magic was i told greg i wanted magic to come at a cost to people yes i and remember my that. original thought traced back to bioshock with the plasmids and how they sort oh, of gain yeah. their power through injecting it into their veins and stuff. Um, so Greg's done a really great job of, you know, sort of visualizing that for me to some degree. And I'm I'm looking forward to having my players engage with some phages as they mm-hmm. make their way through the campaign. Yeah. Um, when it comes to when it comes to magic, would it be would it be a case where to you, to use any spell you have you have to consume just as much or is consumption kind of a banking of magical effects so how i saw it is is that um it, it's kind of like the old school some of the old school dnd um clones have done where if you want to cast a spell you have to like gather up all the materials you have to um learn the phrases so to speak and all this stuff and then cast it and then you basically are back to square one again so you would have your materials like say you're a metallophage um and you want to manipulate metal in a particular way um you have to consume it and then maybe wait an allotted time, and it may take uh, a hit to sanity or health along the way in order to produce this this item or the, um, this effect, right? But we've left a lot of it up to the groups as well. Yeah. I was going to so say that, that way they can have fun with it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, in my mind, I was just going to say that uh, the expertise of the phage also sort of matters in terms of like what they're capable of and what uh, they can do because I do think that. Uh, like we said, magic comes at a cost, so it's sort of, you know, what you're willing to put your body and your mind through when it comes to, uh, like, what you're able to cast and what uh, what you're willing to take in. Because we do have, like, on top of what Greg's already mentioned with, um, like, metal users, we also have people who can do, like, blood magic as well. Um, so you can run away with your imagination on that one, but... yeah. And I found some really weird ones. I was like, you know, like we have ones where they have to take cer- a certain narcotics or they mm-hmm. have to use blood or bones or decaying things or metal. And so there's different schools around for phages. And that's the cool part about it is is that um, we haven't limited the groups to like, oh, here are the spells that you have to that you can cast. Instead, it's here are the schools of thought that exist 
come up with the rest yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and give them that, give them guidance, of course, but uh, allow for the fantastical to really be fantastical, you know. Mm -hmm. um, don't just limit it to like, oh, it's on pages 85 through yeah. know, 110. Use your imagination, you know, you know go crazy. Exactly. And then maybe they find um, what we call like emergent gameplay, you know, mm -hmm. where they have, um, where they come up with these spells that you never thought of. Like, for example, I was playing with my niece and nephew w with Dragon Town, and they were d learning Metallophage, and they came up with some really creative ways to use Metallophagy to um, kill a an opponent. And I was just like, I was amazed by it, because I was like, I never thought of it, you know? And so I think that's something we really want to capture in this game, too, is is um, the emergent gameplay. Let, let players kind of give them some guidance, give them some rules, uh, give them some examples, of course, but let them kind of take over and let the referee kind of be the arbitrator between them and the rules and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and with that, with that, in, with that in mind, especially given the the nature of the city, um, mm -hmm. part of me, part of me is curious if anybody has brought up the video game Arcanum to to either of you. Not me. Not to me. Yeah, uh, that's news to me. <laughs> Kingdom. I'm gonna have to look that up. Uh, the full the full title is I I believe Arcanum of of Steamworks and Magic Obscura. Magic Obscura. Yep. Obscura right yeah. here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. This is a. It is an holy. interesting beast. It was designed mm -hmm. by the by the by the guys who were responsible for the early Fallout games. Um, oh, okay. And, oh, okay puts a lot of thought that into into it into its version of steampunk meets magic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the fact that most people who are working in anything that involves some sort of technology don't like don't like mages mostly because of the fact that technology relies on things working the way that they're supposed to mm -hmm. and but magic is but magic well the idea of things working the way they're supposed to, according to according to physics or the like, kind of gets broken around them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. if you're if you've got a little bit of magic, you might be encouraged to ride towards the back of the train or not be on the train at all. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, and with that with that in mind, what sort of relationship does magic have with technology? Some t some settings they grow up together some settings one disrupts the other uh, where do you guys sit on that kind of thing or do you leave it up to the table you want me to answer this Greg or do you want to take yeah this go time? ahead you go ahead uh, so I mean ultimately everything is left up to the table and how the how people sort of want to use it in my mind uh, Dragon Town sort of looks down on a lot of magic users to some degree but there are people in the city, uh, to think of a couple names, I mean, uh, bo uh, both the leaders of the mob family immediately come to mind, like Russell Piscata and uh, Cataldo Serafina both immediately jump to mind as someone who would try to take advantage of the use of magic uh, in terms of machinery. Mm -hmm. We do have our inventor types around the town as well, so I imagine they would have some interest in that. Mm -hmm. And when the public works, right? Yeah, I was going to say, ultimately, if magic can be used in a technological way, I definitely think Public Works would want to get a hand on that as well so that they could be sort of ahead of the game. Uh, you know, they pride themselves on maintaining order in Dragon Town. So I imagine Public Works is probably probably behind a lot more experimentation than we actually get to know, I imagine. The way Public Works was described, for whatever reason, I ended up thinking of Comstar and how <laughs> Comstar would always try and maintain the balance of power while yeah. tr while trying their very best to be as um as ha as having having as much plausible deniability as possible. Yep. No, yeah. we oh, yeah. we didn't we didn't blow up we didn't blow up your ship. That was oh, that was no. uh, that was that was you we do apologize for the fact that you were blown up by some white ships that were mm -hmm. not affiliated with us or anyone yeah, and you we know. do not claim credit or responsibility for your stuff getting blown up. 
Yeah, Public Works definitely doesn't, you know, pick nobody's off of the street to use in their little experimentation that they do around magic in the city. They definitely would never do that, you know, if I was to be the no, head director. No, it was just, this, Works, rad- it was just would, this radical group that has radical been dealt with. Yeah, of course. We've already we've already gotten a handle on it, guys. You don't even have to worry about it anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's how I picture Public Public Works and the Shadow Bank. I would probably say kind of fall into that same bracket, probably. In that yeah. regard, I'm reminded of how of how with cer- with certain er- with certain urban and crime fiction settings, I described it as the players being um, in the labyrinth with the Minotaur. You can move around all you all you like, but do not get the Minotaur's attention. <laughs> that yeah yeah, that's kind of a fair way to put it, I'd say yeah. And in this case, the the min- could the Minotaur be Public Works? Yes. Could it be? He- could be the could be the Serafina family, yes. Yes. Could it be the Trapani family, yes. Absolutely. Could it be the Shadow Bank, yes. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. There's a lot of groups in Dragon Town. You don't want to, you don't really want to catch the ire of. I'll say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and the cool thing is, is like when uh, we were envisioning the city, I thought of um, having uh, a reputation system. Something we're still looking into where you could play off the different factions and, and gain certain respect amongst them and stuff. And, and um, you know, one of the things I always liked about uh, some of the, the newer Fallout games was the reputation system was kind of fun to mess with. Because you get like, yeah, you, you do this one task and you lose favor with this group or do this task and, and you gain favor with this other group and all this other stuff. And... And uh, so hopefully by the next update, we're hoping to have something the, along the lines of a cool reputation and uh, faction system that referees can use to um, deepen the story and also make for fun tension at the table, you know? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. The tunnel rat will remember this. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And, hey, hey, at least we're not, at least we're not do. At least you guys wouldn't be doing another uh, another bo- another blo- city block needs your help or something like that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Have I not made it clear that I, that I I really really don't like that guy? No, I can't blame you. <laughs> you've you've I'm played right you've played Fallout Four. You pr- oh you yeah, my pain. another oh, yeah. needs your help. Yeah, no, believe me. The only the only thing worse than that was Otis back in Dead Rising, but that's a different matter. <laughs> that's a different matter entirely, yeah. Uh, but and I could I could see ways that it that could be done, especially given the die setups that you guys have. Mm-hmm. And wor- worst case scenario, you could always you could always steal a page from the Black Hack and use the usage die for for <laughs> rep for a reputation system. Yeah. Yeah, I thought about that too, and and uh, I remember was it uh, the guy who put together the black hack? I think he he has recently come against um, the usage die and said he hate kind of hates it now because like everyone's using a usage die now. So, so hipster, got it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so everyone's doing it. We can't do it now, right? That is that. <laughs> I might be a bit harsh, but I find that to be really stupid. Yeah, I can understand that too. Because if we're if because I th- I think a lot of I think a lot of times when people advance that kind of argument, they don't think about um, putting it to his logical conclusion. Everybody's yeah. using dice systems, so we have to. So should we not use dice? <laughs> Well, it depends on who you ask. There are the diceless RPG folks. Oh, oh I, yeah. I know, and they are a special bunch. Um, Amber was one, and I can't remember the other big the one back. In Lords the day. of yeah. Lords. There's most more recently, recent, and I say recent in quotes. Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. Um, yeah. There was the Marvel Universe game, which is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the uh, Marvel RPG lineage. Um, <laughs> there, there's, pro- there's probably. I th- I remember Amber Diceless back in yeah. the day. Um, mm-hmm. They're out. They're out there. They're just not as many. I know some people refer to games like Dragonlance Fifth Age and the and um the and car- and card based RPGs as diceless. 
I don't. Yeah. Um, well, because they're they're technically using a random generator or a, a pseudo random generator, so. Yeah, which is yeah. why I, which is why they don't count as diceless. Yeah, exactly. But with given the, given the given the way a lot of a lot of crime a lot of crime fiction and 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 the like approach approach a adva a advancing narrative have you guys have you guys given thought to some sort of hideout system down the road you know ho something equivalent to holdings but a little bit more separate a little bit more setting appropriate you know i thought of um I always thought the idea would be kind of cool for for both criminals and for non-criminal characters is to have like a like a base of operations or like a, a, a place where they can catch their breath. So like uh, Tyler has them go to the diner, you know. Yeah, they and, yeah, my ahead. campaign follows uh, like a group of detectives currently, and so I've created this place called the Maximus Moonlight Diner, where they it's sort of like a hub for them to be in between, you know a case here, a case there, or like, you know, some offhand work. And it's just kind of a place for them to sit down and like take a moment. Mm -hmm. And it, it, but it doesn't involve, you know, the classic scenario of, Oh, the party lives together. These, these people do not like one of them is a rap person. Another one's super high society. Two of them are like seasoned detectives who are taking on these two interns or one <laughs> intern. Sorry. The rap person is a detective. We clarified that last session. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, a sort of hub slash hideout place would be great. And the, and you know when I do eventually end up writing a uh, criminal campaign for this uh, for this game, I I think that that would definitely be something I'll I'll include in it to some degree once me and Greg sort of uh, flesh it out. Because the current one that I've I've written and I'm pretty much done with my writing portion of it is entirely a uh, classic noir detective story. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I do, I do have to ask the question: Do you have the characters in trench coats? <laughs> <laughs> that is up to player interpretation. But I surely hope that the rat person character is wearing a trench coat. I think uh, that would be awesome. It fits his character, to be honest. It does. And a fedora too. You know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ears, you know, absolutely. Think of uh, crime the crime city twitch skin is what immediately comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd be lying if I said I did. I didn't. Ha I didn't have at least one character who would always would always wear a heavy trench coat because <laughs> un underneath it all was just a um, colony of rats. Yep. Which I blatantly stole that <laughs> idea from from the from those from that old uncanny book that I had as a kid of the of the kid who was who would come in in layers who came in in layers and layers of coats, and when taking <laughs> all of them off, it's just a dead rat under all of it. Yeah. <laughs> but the uh, now when it comes to when it comes to combat being deadly, this is this is this is where I couldn't help but notice the clock system that you that you guys have. Hmm. Um There's a lot of ways to handle the idea of deadly when it comes to combat. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be fair of me to say that in, in your case, there's a bit there's a bit more emphasis on giving on giving options to dodge rather than mitigate damage? So I see um, the clock system as a way to uh, one add a role playing element to it, and two also give opportunities for the referee to say, "This is dangerous. Are you sure you want to do this?" Um, for some new players who want to be like murder hobos and whatnot, and so like weapons do between one and five damage. Um, so you're t if you look at the clock, that that takes you down quite a bit. And so um, the idea is we want them to dodge, we want them to avoid certain deadly tasks, and maybe find a new tactic to where they can subdue a foe or kill a foe without you know taking a bunch of bullets to the chest, you know. Um, I always had problems when I when I was the forever DM or GM, um, you know, especially in like D and D. At a certain point, your characters become like 
Like they can just take a lot of damage. It, it just mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. Role playing wise, it's like, oh yeah, I got a spear in my throat, but I st- I'm still good, you know. Um, yeah. And I think of uh, the old school. Yeah, it's just it is but a scratch, which I got on my little thing right there too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it, to me, I want combat to be deadly, exciting, terrifying, all at the same time. So that way, players know that there's consequences for like picking a fight with this big guy who might pummel you to death, you mm-hmm. know, um, or getting out in a shootout with cops. You know, I, I did a heist version of this game with my niece and nephew and it was hilarious. So they were trailing, uh, my sister-in-law and her son were trailing this, this cop and he turns around, pulls the gun on her and my, uh, nephew got behind him and hit him with a baseball bat, killed him immediately because he he got it like this superb role and he couldn't believe it he's just like i killed somebody and, and i'm like yeah and there's blood everywhere he's kind of convulsing on the ground you might and then my yeah. sister-in-law her character had to like snuff this guy out you know just yeah. to put out the final flame but um you know i want that that moment of of like almost panic and mm-hmm. having to make a decision and having to be in the moment when you have 400 hit points, eh, it's not that much fun. But when you got four, basically four to five hits that you can take before you're dead, I mean, that, that does something to you. It makes you want to either, you know, maybe you want to keep rolling up characters every time and just kill your character off, or yeah. maybe you take that into consideration go okay how am i gonna subdue this individual how am i gonna kill this opponent without getting killed myself yeah you know and then the referee can interject say hey have you thought of this what about this you know and it becomes a collaborative collective experience so combat's less about i'll roll a d20 all right that's great you do this you do this blah 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 yeah it's just to me that's boring Mm-hmm. I want I want combat to be exciting and and deadly of course because I I'm, I'm a realist junkie in some ways in some ways not you know cuz those clocks aren't necessarily realistic either so mm-hmm. no we've we've been de- we've been down the road of re- of realism centric design and I don't want I don't feel like going back I've done my time Yeah <laughs> same here the shortest games you could imagine Exactly um, I don't feel I don't feel like going back to what what has been affectionately nicknamed fantasy fucking Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like yeah. to say I came up with that term, but I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's all good. So when it comes now, I I know that you guys have said that you haven't you haven't been able to do a lot of playtesting, but there's still there's still some. Um, mm-hmm. What were some of the lessons that you felt you had taken away from the playtests? Uh, off of the first one that we did, or uh, that I did, um, my immediate need was to uh, have uh, Fortune and Discord reworded so that I understood it a little bit better, <laughs> because that was on me, ultimately. It was just the way I read the rules. But, um, yeah... It, off of the one session that I've had so far, um, I think my only regret was giving anyone a gun so far because that has allowed them to solve <laughs> a lot of problems very quickly. Um, we have this, you know, because I treat everything, you know, if if they come to me with the idea of oh I pull a gun on this guy, I have to think to myself, okay, what, if I'm this guy and someone pulls a gun on me, do I just give up what I'm doing or am I going to be, you know? insane and try to keep doing whatever i'm doing and a lot of the time until they came across like some day walkers who were like these hyped up magic users um most people would be like well i don't want to die so Mm -hmm. they would just surrender most of the time so i think uh although i will say my favorite part of the campaign currently goes back to our rat person once again because he (laughs) is a sort of diy genius kind of character um well not really a genius but he diy stuff quite a bit and he has a nail gun shotgun that he affectionately refers to as his sharp shooty um and sometimes (laughs) it'll work and sometimes it won't 
Um, but this is the <laughs> third version of that gun, by the way, because the other two versions killed people because they backfired on them, which uh, actually ended up getting him kicked out of the tunnel rats. But that sounds yeah. that sounds like a <laughs> occupational hazard. He is a walking occupation. His name is Step On. I don't think I've mentioned his name yet. His name is Step On. Um, and he's great. He's uh, played by my buddy Tim, who always brings a fun character to the uh, to the mix. And I think what uh, what I've learned really from that one session is that I look forward to more mechanic developing. Like, the burden and compels uh, add a lot RP-wise and sort of allow me to sort of be like, oh, okay, you know, this takes away from and this gives to roles and that with the traits and stuff. I'm also looking forward to because we didn't have knacks and stunts developed when we started uh, the other day, but we're going to have them now that we're going to be playing again on Thursday. So I'm I'm more or less just curious to see how different things get added to the game and how they sort of develop in the game. Um, mm-hmm. But outside of that, I I've really I've really enjoyed my time with this system so far, even if it has been short. Uh, it's been fun. It's mm-hmm. been fun watching uh, watching people get creative. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the group that I have is great, so I'm I'm always happy to play TTRPGs with them. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and and hey, more people means there's more people to blame when the dice gods decide to be the dice gods. Absolutely. Because <laughs> I be- I believe that they are a model of equality. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your ethnicity is, what your orientation is. They hate you. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, to go on um, what Tyler was saying, I, I've play tested the system, oh gosh, uh, a few dozen times now, in you know, in a few minute stretches to few hour stretches to, you know, various other methodologies, and I I'll have to say, you know, one of the things that I um, found a little disheartening at first was, we when we first started the system, it was going to be, um, oh what was it? So we were going to do like one to two were going to be a success and then everything else was something else. And then that got shot all to hell when I played it. And I was like, ah, screw it. And then this is when I go to Breathless. And the skill degradation was one that I couldn't quite get myself on board with. And I think Tyler also had the same problem where you know, if you have a skill degrade in the original system, it goes from like, say, you're a D6 and in, uh, Intimidation. All right, you use it, and then you go down to a D4, which is a hell of a lot um, different in rolling and everything else. And so you can only get a uh, success with complications. That's as high as you can get success-wise. And so I didn't think that was too fair to the players. And so we started adding in some modifiers with the, the mind, body, and soul attributes, and the positive traits, which I saw uh, Tyler use really interestingly with uh, one of the chases. I think he had the, was it Royal? Royal, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Royal, yeah. Very small. And so yeah, yeah. one of the positive traits is that he's nimble. So I, I think I gave him a plus two to, uh, I think it was an athletic check, maybe? Yeah, maybe I, think you're I right. can't quite remember. But he jumped on this guy's back to stop him mid-chase. And then yeah. along comes Lindy playing her character, and she pulls the gun, and I'm like, "Well, this chase is over." Yeah, it was spectacular. <laughs> it was the it was the coolest like action sequence we had yeah. at that point, you know. And when I did the heist version of this game, um, same thing. You know, when we used to combat the first I, combat, I was like, oh, "I'm going to have action points and roll a d20 to see who goes first and blah blah blah." And then I was like, "Oh fuck it, we're going to go." Just RP it. You know, how would these characters react? You know, who would go first? Who most likely pull the trigger first and then go from mm-hmm. there? Yep. And that, that, I mean, accelerated things to the point where, you know, you go from, you know, five minutes of combat lasting two hours at the table to about the same amount of time that it, it should be at the table. You know, it should be quick, deadly. And then you go from there. You react. How? Mm-hmm. What's going to happen next, and stuff like that. So, so playtesting for me has been a lot of trial and error, and figuring out what works for us and for our setting. Because I feel like mechanics and setting go together. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that deadliness, I think, really jives with the, the noir vibes that we have with the setting. 
Mm-hmm. So, absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, and of granted, being granted, trial and error is ju- is just a part of the is just a part of the matter. It's probably why Einstein has that whole definition of insanity thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how Dragon Town develops with time. Yeah, we're we're super stoked because it's. Mm. I mean, like I said, it started off as a setting and then just took on a mind of its own and now it's where it is in the world, so. Mm-hmm. So, with, the, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, <laughs> happy to be here. You know, the drinks yeah, are happy great. To be, yeah, happy to be. Yeah, great. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Absolutely. <laughs> and I like that policy. Of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!